Welcome back to another episode of the Final Bosses Podcast, episode six, joined once again by my ever faithful co-host, Ultimate Floyd. What's up, man? Not much. Good to be back. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I had to survive Hurricane Irma for this episode. <laughs> Saw that. It's rough. That's good that uh, nothing crazy happened. Like, and you're like, I guess you're home didn't get like utterly destroyed or anything right no my home my home is fine although the streets are it it took a while to clean things up and you could still see some some wreckage here and there but you know think things have like for me have gone back to normal and I, i find it funny because when i uploaded episode five people were like Oh, the podcast is back. It's been on such a long hiatus. Well, well, th- that pa- that episode had been recorded for a while. The reason I didn't get it up was, yeah, the, Irma kind of ruined my my shit. So glad, uh, glad you're safe though. That was, uh, yeah, watching the the news of that is pretty insane. Yeah, actually, what I did was I went up to Orlando. And by the time the hurricane had reached me in Orlando, it had gone from a Category 5 in Miami to a Category 3 in Orlando. Because when a hurricane uh, resides over land, it loses its power because it gets its strength from the water. Yes. So so by the time it got to Orlando, it lost a lot of its strength. And I actually slept through it and didn't even, Uh like, notice there's like a there is a huge difference in strength between category five and category three. Like category three, I mean, it can do damage, but like that by that point, it's less the wind and more like if it's like a or uh, the rain, like if it'll cause flooding or stuff. But it wasn't that kind of hurricane, so we were pretty much fine. Okay, yeah, good to hear. Yeah, I imagine the like there's probably so many people traveling from Miami to Orlando. It must have been like nuts. Uh, actually, most people went on like one highway to try and get up to Orlando, and we chose uh, a less used one. So uh. while we were still like normally, it wouldn't have taken that long because I've gone up down down and up from Miami to Orlando several times. So it did take longer than it normally would have, but it still w- wasn't as bad as if we would have taken the normal route because that would have taken us like an extra couple of hours because traffic was like really backed up so luckily we didn't have to deal with that right yeah anyways i don't want to keep talking about that <laughs> <laughs> what have you been playing man what's how, what, what you've been doing uh so september is like absolutely nuts for games like i can't remember the last time there's been a month where there's been like so many games i've wanted to play uh, I guess the two recent ones, I did just finish Metroid Samus Returns on 3DS. Uh, I've got a yeah. review. Yeah, I got a review up of that. And like, uh, it's it's everything I hoped it would be. Uh, I, I guess I'd say, I guess I was a little cautious just because of Mercury Steam. I really haven't cared for any other games. Uh, but I know they did a they did a great job with this one. It's I I don't know if I prefer it over another Metroid remake that the fan game. I kind of go back and forth. I think they both have their strengths and weaknesses. But uh, I I don't know. I really thought this was uh, quite uh, enjoyable. And a lot of the additions they made make uh, were like really smart. Like the free aim, I think, is absolutely genius. Where you actually like have precision aiming and you have like this little laser sight uh it just makes the metroid fights so much easier this time around where you can actually aim at their weak points properly uh the melee counter i think is really cool uh, what adds to bosses is kind of that risk reward system where if you don't time it right you'll get take a lot of damage but if you do you can end up doing like a ton of extra damage to the bosses and a lot of the enemies uh the level design is really good it's still got that exploration that i love about metroid even though it's it's a lot more linear compared to some other games in the series uh like the 3d looks amazing in it i really like the the visuals i uh, just i don't know i had a great time with it i do think it's make maybe a little too long uh which is weird to say about like a 2d metroid usually they're fairly short but this one i thought kind of outstated welcome a little bit towards the end but uh, uh boss fights were amazing too i actually really love the boss fights towards the end but uh 
it's, it's like Metroid fans uh, just definitely need to play this. I hope it sells well because they've said, I think uh, if it sells well, we might be getting more like side scrolling Metroids, which I, I could definitely go for more. Uh, I know I bought my copy. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad you did. I, when, are you, when do you think you're going to get around to playing it? I'm not totally sure because I'm still debating whether I should play it or an, uh, another Metroid 2 remake. Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably find playing either one first. I am looking forward to it. I, I similar to you, was a little hesitant. Not because I hate all of Mercury Stream's <laughs> games like you, but because they did make Mirror of Fate, I think it was called, on the 3DS, yeah. which which was... Yeah, I, I hated that game. I, could, I, could, I couldn't stand it. I didn't hate it, but I definitely didn't like it. Like, it was... It, like, I felt like for everything it did, like, right or okay, there was something else that was just like, what the fuck? Like, it was... <laughs> it was such a baffling game to me. And, like, the, the interconnectedness, like, was barely there. It was so boring to explore. Like... The, the characters were too similar to each other. The combat was basically a ripoff of the combat from Lords of Shadow. Like, yeah, the the, the leveling system was trash. I, I guess I really didn't like that game that much. <laughs> yeah, the I mean, the combat, speaking of combat, I guess, the combat in this one, in San Francisco Returns, is probably the best combat uh, in a 2D Metroid game. Like, I, I think it, like, it's just plays so well and I like a lot of the aeon abilities you get are awesome as well like it's it doesn't have the interconnectedness that a lot of metroid games do it's like you're kind of going from area to area which is kind of like how the original metroid 2 on game boy was like but uh the areas are a hell of a lot bigger than that game like that game apparently you could get through in like four hours where this it took me like 13 hours i think to get 100 percent of all the items so it's it's a pretty lengthy game uh, how long was uh, the other one? Uh... Another Metroid remake was, I think, five hours, five or six. So it oh, was substantially shorter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like the areas were a lot smaller in that game. I do think the level design in the remake, the fan remake, was a little better. Uh, this game, I feel like it's a lot of like ball or morph ball mazes, and then a lot of areas where you're just going left to right, sh shooting and fight, fighting a lot of a lot of enemies. Like, I feel like the level design was a little more creative than other Metroid games. It's kind of funny because I follow the creator of the remake, of the fan remake on Twitter. And when he saw the, 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 the melee counter from Samus Returns, he said it, it almost made him want to go back and like retrofit it into the game. Yeah, it's it's great. It's surprisingly good. I, I feel like a lot of people say that it hampers the pacing. Like, cause I guess you would have to stop and wait for an enemy to attack you to use it. But uh, I, it's like really helpful in the early game. But by the time you get to like the even like le before the midpoint, like a lot of your beam weapons are really powerful and you can just like go through enemies like butter. So it's I mainly used it for bosses. I think bosses is where it's at its best. Uh, cause like some of them are actually become cakewalks if you're able to really counter their attacks in time. You can like do like a lot of extra damage. I'm literally looking forward to playing it. I mean, I love Metroid, so I I have to play it. Yeah, how can you not like Metroid? But uh, yeah, I I think Mercury Steam. After seeing this, I think they can do like a great Metroid game of their own. I actually kind of hope that they do do the next one, but with Nintendo kind of wow. guiding them. Yeah, crazy for me to say, uh, as someone that just hates their games. But I mean, I I was really impressed by Samus Returns. I got I gotta say. But, well, by my estimation, they only made one half decent game, so I can't really, <laughs> I can't, I can't say that I, I blame you there. But yeah, I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm glad, and hopefully they do make the next one, and it's also good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the other game I'm playing is Ease Eight, which, uh, Woo! yeah, I this game's great, man. I love this. Uh, I mean, I've always loved the Ease games. I've played most of them at this point. I think the only ones I haven't played are Ease Arc of Nepishtim, which I think was six, and then yeah, Ease six. Yeah, and then Ease five, which I don't think has gotten a remake, has it? No. No, yeah, so I'm kind of waiting, I guess, for the remake of, of that. Oh, and E7 I haven't played, actually. I forgot about that. 
Get but, it on Steam. Yeah, I am gonna get it on Steam for sure. I'm glad it got a Steam release. But uh, yeah, although this... I, I, although unfortunately at this point, it's gonna feel like a prototype of East Eight. Yeah, like the East games, like I feel like the combat just gets better and better with each entry. That it can be a little hard to go back to some of the older ones. Like E seven is still a really good game, but like the little I played of E eight, I was like, yeah, this is gonna make going back to seven and Salsetta a little harder. Yeah, I mean, I still think there's kind of an appeal in like something like uh, Oath of Falgana because it's so short. I sort of miss the shorter ease games in a way because I think you can you know get through them quick and the combat is still really fun. Uh, they're just kind of like nice. RPGs to play when you don't have a lot of time to dedicate to a bigger one, right? But sure. Ease Eight, yeah, Ease Eight apparently is like really long. Like I think it's like forty hours supposed to be that, which I think what Ease Seven was how long? Like thirty five or thirty? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. So this one's even bigger than that. But uh, I like the kind of the concept for Ease Eight, where you kind of get shipwrecked on this island and you're kind of like charting this this island that people basically it's like this cursed island and apparently the only way to actually access it is i forget what were the what was their weird explanation that you had to get shipwrecked or something or like washed ashore like you couldn't actually access the island by boat yeah i i I think i think there's like turbulent storms or something yeah it's weird, yeah. but it's it's cool because you're kind of like exploring this island uh, and mapping it out for yourself. And I feel like that really gets like the whole adventurous aspect of ease that I've always loved uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, and you kind of have like this little village that you start out with and you're kind of building it. Uh, you're kind of uh, finding castaways from the, the ship that you were on and kind of building this village. And you get new NPCs. You'll kind of get like their approval ratings up. Uh, and each of them can do different things like upgrading your weapons and armor. Uh, you have like this little farm that you can tend to. Uh, so it really makes the exploration pretty rewarding, uh, finding like these new NPCs. And you kind of like have different areas you can go to on this island. You're not like just... Uh, strictly following the main story path you can find like extra uh, castaways to kind of unlock previous areas because you've got like these little like all these different parts of the environment like you might find like a big rock uh, and you'll need like 10 castaways to be able to push it Uh, so I kind of like the way the the world is kind of gated uh, and it's not like totally like super linear so I, I enjoy that as well the combat is just Oh man, super fast paced. I love all the skills that you that you're gonna acquire. Uh, I love the flash guard and flash dodge systems, which apparently I've forgotten that they're in uh, Salsetta. I guess yeah, they are. I guess the timing on them was so strict that I never actually used them all that much. This game. Um, I I never bothered with flash guard, but I remember using the flash step a lot in Salsetta. Yeah, like I use them both in this one because the flash uh, step basically slows down time, so that can be useful in certain situations, but the flash guard uh, increases your damage output for temporarily. So there's, you know, there's a, an advantage to use both depending on like the boss or enemies that you're fighting. So, and the timing isn't like uh, super strict, but at the same time it's not like you just can't mash the the dodge button and, and pull it off. So I, I really love that uh, aspect of the game. Uh, and yeah, it's just a ton of fun. Uh, I will say the main story is not super compelling. You have like the, you know, you're kind of exploring this island and, you know, uh, making a map, but you've also got this weird, a little, it's really odd. You have like these weird flashbacks to this character named Donna. And every time you like sleep at a campfire and I guess like you, you play as her sometimes, and I guess you'll, you might end up meeting her later in the game. And you might try to, I guess, remove the curse that's on this island. I suppose that's what the story is going. It's so just a little. It's about her lacrimosa. What does that even mean? What does that mean? <laughs> like honestly, the title is even so stupid. I hate it. It's so bad. It's so bad. Like I remember when I when the game first got announced, I, I my brain didn't even process it. It was like, oh, okay, Lacrimosa of Donna, whatever, another, like, fucking JRPG name. But the more, like, I kept hearing it and the more I kept, like, oh, my God, that name is awful. <laughs> I don't, like, it's, I don't get it, man. It's, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I, I, I don't know. I, I feel mean, like the, the writing. Okay, 
here, here's the thing. L- lacrimosa itself, I don't think is actually a word. It might be Latin. I don't know. But there is something that sounds similar to it, which is lacrimous, which is a synonym for uh, sadness or depression or, you know. I'm sorry. Oh, huh. I mean, I don't think it's depression, but I think it's like, you know, sadness. Interesting. I guess the game's not called Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days. That That's true. Remember Did you Final play that Hearts too? Kingdom... <laughs> or Kingdom Hearts 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue. No, yeah. I think that's the worst. I think that might be the worst video game. That might be the worst. I guess Have you been playing Kingdom Hearts as well? No, no, I still need to, I don't have, there's no time, Danganronpa came out, uh, Cuphead oh, yeah. comes out in a few days, Mario Odyssey is next month, I still need to play Monster Hunter Stories that I bought, and it's just sitting sealed. Oh, uh, too many games! Too much, but uh, yeah, that's that's ease. I, I will say, I guess the story, the writing in, in Ease 8 feels like a little weak compared to previous games, I'm really not totally invested uh, like in the actual story and the characters are a little I don't know, they're a little dull uh, but I don't know it's not a huge I've always played the ease games for the gameplay more so than the, the story I guess I kind of like that uh, girl Laxia she's annoying at first but she's getting she is getting better I, I like her more now like I, I, got, I already known this because I I did a stream, and that's basically what I play of the game. So she kind of annoyed me at first, but I could already tell that, you know, there was more to her. You know, she, she had m- yeah. more depth to her character than just being, like, that archetype. So I could tell, like, okay, they're they're going places with her. Yeah. I, one thing I thought was funny is probably the, the quickest that the typical uh, pervert scene comes in a JRPG uh, where you like see her naked or whatever and she's like you pervert and slaps you in the face like i've seen that scene in so many jrpgs oh. that and this this breaks the record for the quickest uh, it happens like the first 10 minutes of the game it's insane yeah i was not like because i always feel like the east games were kind of classy like because <laughs> like to me east games have always harkened back to the good old days of of JRPGs, right? Like, right. you know, n- swords and sorcery, knights and chivalry, you know, that kind of stuff and and going on adventures and, you know, this is it's always had the anime aesthetic, but East never felt like especially anime to me. So to see such a blatantly like anime trope in it was like, oh, why it's it it's weird it's it's actually the only time it really happens after that it's okay. not nothing like that really happens again it's it's kind of okay, weird okay okay that 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 does assuage me a bit yeah it's it's yeah <laughs> i just i always make a bet with myself before i play a jrpg oh is this gonna have that that scene and most of the time it does especially modern modern games I don't think I don't think Berseria had that. It did not. What have you been playing, man? I beat Berseria. I don't know if I mentioned yeah. that last time. Uh, long I don't even remember. Yeah, I don't remember. But yeah, I beat that and it was awesome. Loved it. What a strong ending. Yeah. What a what a great what a great fucking story. Great cast of characters. Not the best combat, but, you know, still better than Zysteria's combat for sure. Oh, uh, overall, return to form. I'm, 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 I can safely say I'm looking forward to the next Tales game. So, I find it interesting. Like, I feel like by now, usually the next Tales game is announced or shown off. But it, I feel it's, like, been a while. Good. Uh, Let them take a fucking break. <laughs> I wonder if we're finally getting a new engine. For a tale please, game. please. <laughs> as much as I liked Berseria, oh my god, fuck that art style or that graphic style. It's it's old. It's like the yeah. same shit since Zillia. I've been fighting the same fucking wolves since Zillia. Just please. 
you know, they've said uh, that they're working on a Tales game for the Switch. I do wonder if that's going to be the new one or if they're doing, like, a remake for the Switch and then, like, a new one for, like, PS4. I'm I, willing I to bet it's a port. I'm, yeah. I'm like, will, yeah, pretty sure it's a port. Either that or it, it, the new Tales game that's going to come out is going to have a Switch port. Yeah, that, yeah. I could almost see, like, well, no. Have they actually... I don't know. I feel like maybe a remake of Symphonia. I feel like they might do that. It would it would make sense cuz that's the fan favorite. Yep. And Nintendo, it was on Nintendo I guess. I per- well, I guess they did do the remaster of Symphonia. Yeah, there was the HD remaster and the yeah. Steam port which was not great. Yeah, apparently it was like what 30 frames per second compared to y- Yeah. Because the thing is, it's based on the PS2 version. Right. Yeah. Which was hard locked at 30. Yeah. But it had more content. So, eh, yeah. Anyways, uh, moving on from that. Um, I uh, Speaking of East, uh, while all I played of East 8 was on that stream, I did play East Origin for the first time. So, I've finally gotten around to playing that and really enjoying it. Um, that one plays more like Oath and Fogana and E6. And I think it's the only game in the series where you don't play as Adel in any capacity. No, you, you don't. It's actually, it is the only one. And I really like the girl that you play as. I think you play as two other characters as well, but Unica, she's like, yeah. She's kind of uh, like a very nice and wholesome girl, and she's. Um, it's kind of refreshing because usually you play as like a stupid idiot, you know, kid, and it's. I don't know. It's nice to play as a, a wholesome girl for for a change. Yeah, but, the, uh, are, you're playing on PS4. Yeah, I am. Okay. Yeah, I played it on. PC like I bet I think it right went around when it came out like almost immediately after Oath of Fagana but it's it's really good I like the the whole tower thing that it almost feels like a dungeon crawler actually yeah it wow. does it it was a little weird at first cuz I'm used to like going around towns and stuff as well yeah. but um it works out like it, it works well for what it does and I like to see the, that kind of style in another ease game but for like one as a one-off, it was cool, I thought. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I also like the SP system. It kind of replaces gold, and you can use it to upgrade your different abilities. Like, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I remember liking that, too. Yeah, East, East Origin, really solid so far. And I've also finally had a chance to start playing Near Automata. Yes, so good. What do you, What do you think of it so far? All right, so, so far, I can easily say it's the best playing Yoko Taro game. Like, hands down, <laughs> like, this, most of the jank is gone, finally. Like, it it actually feels good to play this game, unlike all his other games. Pretty much. <laughs> um, but when you stack it up to, like, other Platinum games, I'd say it's more, like, in the middle, like, it's not as good as, like, Bayonetta or Metal Gear Rising, but it's definitely more fun to play as than that shitty Ninja Turtles game or the mediocre uh, Legend of Korra game or Mad World. Like, not that Mad World's, like, <laughs> bad or anything. Feel but, but, like, Mad World. <laughs> yeah, Mad, Mad World is kind of whatever. <laughs> so I, I'd say, like, as far as, like, Platinum is concerned, you know, in the middle... Not one of their best, but definitely not one of their worst. Like, solid for them. Uh, as for, like, the story and the characters and whatnot, like, I it hasn't, like, fully gripped me yet, but it definitely has me intrigued. Like, I haven't even gotten the first ending yet. I haven't gotten ending oh, A yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you still got some... Uh, I still got some pretty, stuff. But there has been cool. some... There has been some weird stuff that makes me go like, "What the fuck?" Like, uh, I just finished this one part 
uh, I don't want to spoil anything. I think it's called the copied world. Yes. Where everything's like white. That has been the most striking moment in general in the game so far. Like just that 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 whole sequence has been the most memorable moment of the game. And now it's starting to like for me now it's starting to really pick up and it's like okay things are starting to get really good now yeah the copied world the music there is so good i love the the music that plays there it's like so so great okay so get this when i (laughs) when i first played near automata uh or automata how how are you supposed to say it i was streaming it and i had turned down the music during the stream so, you know, it wouldn't be annoying for people listening. And I forgot to turn it back up for a good portion of my playthrough. And for the whole time playing the game, I'm like, geez, people make a, such a big deal about the music, but it's so fucking, like, where does it play? It's so quiet. And now I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm oh, like, I'm no. so fucking dumb. That sucks. Too, the soundtrack is so good in that game. Thankfully, when I got to that part, I had realized my my mistake, and I'm like, okay, I raised it back nice. up. Yeah. But man, I felt so dumb. I was just like, man, where's the fucking music? Like, it, why is the game so quiet? <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. That's funny. Um, I think that's pretty much it for games. Oh, I beat Yakuza Kiwami, which was awesome. Not as good as Zero. Uh, but a great remake, and if you liked Yakuza Zero, you should jump into Kiwami because it's also really good. Yeah, some someday I'll play it. I definitely want to play it, but when I have time. <laughs> but yeah, that that's it for games for me. So you want to jump into the news? Yes, let's do so. So we only have one news article to talk about and it's kind of old at this point um but i think it's worth talking about so uh, an individual by the name of dean takahashi played cuphead and was really bad at it and this sparked the discussion of how good a a game journalist should be at games in order to be a game journalist. So I want to talk more about the discussion rather than Dean himself, because I don't want to like, you know, I'd rather not kick the guy down or anything like that. I'm not interested in like cutting anyone down. That's not cool. Um, No, no. So I'd I'd rather just like talk about the discussion itself. So uh, what do you think about this whole spiel basically yeah so this was kind of interesting to see because it uh it brought out a lot of like topics as far as like reviewing games like you know if you're reviewing a certain game yeah do you really have to be like uh, amazing at it to, to properly review it and you, on both sides you know you had uh, you had a lot of a lot of bullshit with this where you know people like saying he should be fired and all this stuff like which is just absolutely ridiculous i mean I, I wouldn't want to put yeah. the guy down because I mean, if you gave me like a, a shoot 'em up, uh, like I would look like that. Like that's that's the level of play you would see. <laughs> like I mean, you know. Uh, but it's it's this weird thing because you 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 I, I kind of look at it as like if he did end up reviewing that game, right? Uh, and like he, I mean, I don't know. I I do think you need to finish a game to properly review it for the most part. Uh, and if he, well, it depends on if he would finish it or not. But if you say reviewed it and then he shit on the game, then I would kind of be like, okay, yeah, that's a little, like, you really can't be be doing that. I mean, because that, you'd really have to look at it as like, oh, he wasn't very good on the game at the game, so he, you know, he criticizes it. Uh, but also, I guess the thing, the interesting thing with, the, with Dean Takahashi, apparently he reviewed Mass Effect back in the day, the first Mass Effect, and he gave it a poor score uh because it turns out he didn't actually know about the skill points uh and he wasn't he didn't put any skill points into his character so it was really hard for him so he actually shit on the game for it uh and i guess a lot of people like uh called him out on it afterwards saying like uh dude you totally forgot about this skill system uh that's why you were you know you were getting killed so quick or your character 
characters weren't uh, powerful. So in that sense, yeah, I can see where this a uh, problem can come uh, from, you know, reviewing a game while you're not very good at it. But at the same time, it's like a lot of people aren't good at certain types of games. I, I don't think you need to be like this amazing, like expert player uh, to review or talk about the game. And like journalists... Like, they play so many different types of games for the most part, right? And a lot of their articles aren't, like, it, it doesn't have to be a review, right? Like, they, they can do, like, an article just talking about the game. And Dean Takahashi did so himself, right? Uh, it was this really well-written article about, like, uh, you know, difficulty in, in tutorials in, in games, right? So it's like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's like... I, it's it, it provide it did bring up this kind of like interesting discussion. I'm kind of I guess in the in the middle on it. It's just like a game while you're like really bad at it, and then you end up shitting on the game. Like that's where I can see I guess kind of like the where right. some problems can come from. Like I re- there's one YouTuber I like. Um, his name is uh, Noah Ca- Cadwell Gervais, and I remember. Yeah listening to him one time say and he i think it was an interview and he said that yeah it was it was an interview and he said that game controllers give him a headache and that he can only play games with keyboard and mouse now so with that in mind like is it would it really be fair to give him a a console game to play and have him review it like i i would say no because that's not his forte. We all have our own different skill sets. Uh, I like. I have no business reviewing a sports game because I, I hate sports. Yeah, same. You know, <laughs> and, and and I I I probably would suck at it too because I don't know the rules. I don't know if Dean was supposed to do uh to cover Cuphead because uh, his employer wanted him to do it, or if it was his decision or whatever. Um, but part of part of being a game journalist, I would say, is yes, you need to have certain a certain level of competency in games. No, and people are saying that like, um, because I feel like there's a bit of a straw man argument going around because like I, the kind of the reaction I see from a, from this is like, oh, you can't expect this all to be like on an esports level. Well. I don't really see anyone saying that. We're, and and if people are saying that, then yeah, okay, they're being stupid. But, you know, we just, ex- I think most people should just expect, like, to be competent, to just at least be good enough to beat the game. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I think it's pretty clear here with Dean that this is not in his skill set. No. To me, it's similar to with uh, Noah, where like Noah's skill set is PC gaming, and maybe Dean is similar. I don't know, but the point is, this is not within his skill set, so he really shouldn't have been playing the game in the first place. Uh, based on what I've seen, like he doesn't really do reviews. No, he's not reviewing the game, and he even actually said after that video that he's he, he's playing it more and getting better at it, and he he says the game's fun, like he enjoys it, right? But yeah, he's not reviewing it. Cool. So this brings us back to like the main question I feel of how good should it, should a game journalist be? And I think it's just good enough at certain genres that they can beat them. That I think is should be the standard. Yeah, and I guess a lot of game journalists, like the games that they review, they tend to be within their wheelhouse, right? So they have, for the most part, that that competent skill level, right? Like something mm. like Cuphead, it's interesting, I've noticed, like it's a Contra style game, right? It's an arcade Contra style game, the type of game that really doesn't come out that often anymore. And I feel like a lot of game journalists don't go back and play these games endlessly, right? So it's probably one of those things where it's like it's they're playing this type of he's playing this type of game he hasn't played in probably since you know uh, like a long time ago so it's like it's giving him yeah some trouble I I mean I imagine this game's probably gonna give me some trouble because I was never good at Contra style games I'm, I'm I would say I'm a decent at like Mega Man and Mario like those types of games but this is like a like a Contra Metal Slug type of type of game. Yeah, and it looks gorgeous too. Like it looks amazing. Yeah I, yeah, I can't wait for it. I think it looks really good. 
Yeah, it looks like we're, I think we're pretty much on the same page here. So I, I'm going to be honest, guys. Didn't ex I didn't expect that many questions this time, but you motherfuckers pulled through anyways. And there's <laughs> the, the 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 first batch of questions are from Double Dash Three Seventeen. Now, this guy sent like eight questions, which is flattering, but at the same time, we also have a whole lot of other questions so the we're going to answer the first four and then the other four will leave for episode seven so the first question he asks is what are some of your favorite final bosses in gaming oh, actually didn't we, we yeah we, we did cover this we did cover this yeah actually. we did fuck okay so i, re I remember shit. one of his other questions i remember one of of the other one so we'll actually just jump to that one because uh, i it was actually the question i looked at i was like oh that's a i like that question but it was uh what's the hardest game you've played that you haven't completed that i haven't completed and completed yeah so basically i guess the hardest game that you've played but didn't finish but didn't finish no i assume just because it was too hard right <laughs> um probably i want to be the guy that's yeah i wouldn't have thought of that but actually that might be because i was actually thinking about it i think that is probably the game the hardest game i played that i haven't finished i the other two i would say are battle toads i know battle toads is one of those games that like everyone talks about being so hard but go and play that game that game is fucking hard like the 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 motorbike section is just it, it's impossible i swear that the timing you need for it it's just so like insane, and it's so long and fast, like it's ridiculous. I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to replace the word hard with cheap. Yeah, it is. That game it is, is cheap as fuck. I oh, like trial and error. That game, it's ridiculous. Uh, and then the other one is Ghosts and Goblins on the NES. I, I can't even get past the first level. I've played it multiple <laughs> times over the years. I can't get past the first level. It's 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 just oh my god. I've never but. played any of those games. Uh, they they uh, they they look like cool, fun games, but at the same time, I'm like, man, I don't I don't, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> no, there. I try to play them uh, often, like the Super Nintendo one, the NES one, and just I can never seem to get past the first level. It's just the two hits. You die in two hits, and you're weaker when you get hit. The enemies just constantly respawn. Like, it just takes so much, like, memorization uh, just to get through, like, one level. And then you beat the game, and you have to do the entire thing all over again. It's just, like, yeah. I, I, Fuck, I don't... You know what? Fuck that. I'm going <laughs> to play Gargoyle's Quest instead. Yeah, Gargoyle's Quest is sick. Uh, Demon's Quest, especially. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, next he asks, do you like metal? If so, what are your favorite bands? So, yeah. um, I'm not... <laughs> super into like just straight up metal i'm i'm more like a prog rock kind of guy uh i guess like the the closest to metal that i like is strapping young lad which is more extreme metal and not like regular metal the the thing with metal though is there's so many different sub genres of it it's actually kind of absurd <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess you can also kind of count Dream Theater a little bit because they they have like oh, yeah. pro they're like prog metal it, yeah. for certain songs. Like I'd say, like Train of Thought counts as prog metal. Yeah, but that's their most yeah metal album. Yeah, but not I. I'm not really into just like metal. Oh, okay. like I'm. I mean. <laughs> I'm not even a big fan of, and this is going to get me skewered, I'm not that big a fan of Metallica. Oh, man. I do like Master of Puppets, though. But, I, mm, that's it. Interesting. I, I guess I'd say I'm a, a fan of metal. I mean, I like a, a lot of different types of music, but uh, I did, it is, in high school I had that phase where it's like all I listened to like was Metallica and Megadeth, and it was just like nonstop. And I mean, I, like, I honestly can't stand Megadeth. Really? It's, that's funny. I'm in a Megadeth like cover band, I guess, right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I grew up with that that kind of that kind of music, but uh, I, I like a bunch of different type of metal. I tend to like a lot of progressive metal, like technical metal. 
Uh, just just to be clear, I'm not saying like Megadeth is like terrible, just not for me. Uh, the Dave Mustaine's voice, I think, is a lot a sticking point for a lot of people. Yeah, I'm very picky about voices. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I used to be. Uh, now I can get into a lot of like music with like screamed vocals. Like Opeth is one of my favorite bands. Uh, yeah, see, I can't get into that. Like that. <laughs> no, doesn't do it for me. I can't. I, can't I used, get into it. Yeah, I used to not be able to get into it, and now I don't mind it. I think, in fact, in a lot of instances, I kind of like. I think it adds to the aggression of a lot of music. Gojira is another band I absolutely love. Uh, I. Like I, I like a lot of post hardcore too, which I don't know. That's I don't know if it's really metal. That's that's kind of like a subgenre of, of punk. But there's I uh, see like with those like I guess you call them Cookie Monster vo- <laughs> vocals. Like I'm only okay with them in like in spurts. Like in Arion's The Human Equation, for example. Um, uh, what what's the lead singer of Opeth? What's his name? Uh, Mikel. I forget. His, I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, that. Mikel. He's in that. And he represents the emotion fear. And he he has, like, he, he'll only come in, like, a few moments. And he, he also sings clean vocals. But sometimes he'll come in with those guttural vocals at just the right time. And it's just like, Mwah! beautiful like perfect like it just suits the mood of of the song and the story because it's a concept album and it's like perfect but to hear a whole song like that for me i'm just like i'm not there yet okay so yeah you wouldn't like something like august burns red <laughs> like it's just like screen vocals constantly but uh as far as like metal one band i do want to mention this like really underrated like this canadian band it's actually they're i would consider them technical metal punk uh yeah it sounds weird <laughs> it sounds weird but yeah it's it's like a combination of the two uh it's they're called propagandi uh and like they're just like it's just really intriguing like progressive music but with like that punk punk lyricism that i i really like as, as well they're like from winnipeg i think like they're really fantastic cool all right. Uh, next question is: Should a game be difficult in order to enjoy it? Um, I, I think he means: um, Does a game have to be difficult in order to be enjoyed? So big, I'm gonna say n- no. Yeah, big no, big no. Yeah, no. I, I mean, a game should be whatever it needs to be. Yes. It, so, like, the Dark Souls games, or the, the Souls games in general, are difficult because that's part of the experience. But at the same time, it's not going to do anyone any good if uh, a kid's game is really difficult. If anything, that's going to take away from the experience. Because little kids are going to be playing it, and there's, there's no reason for them to be, like, dealing with Dark Souls level of difficulty. No, yeah, I, I never play a game and then just like that's what I look for in games is difficulty. Like that's number one. Like I just it's never been what uh, is appealing to me. The only instance where I I do is like side scrolling platforms, just because I've played those types of games for so long. Uh, an easy platformer becomes kind of dull for me. Like I do need some kind of challenge, but overall, I just. I don't know uh, games go for different uh, different things. I, every not every game needs to be difficult. Ideally, uh, a game should be a balance of you know difficult, but also like easy enough to where you can overcome the challenges. So like there's kind of like a sweet spot like in the middle. Yeah, it's like if a game is, I I gotta say I do tend to. Well, I don't know. I, 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 like, if a game's too easy or too hard, for the most part, it really doesn't bother me. Although, actually, sometimes when a game's too hard, if, like you were saying, if it's like a kid's game or a game that doesn't seem like it should be as difficult as it is, it can get annoying. But Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it also depends on, for me especially, sometimes it's just my mood. Like, sometimes I don't want to play something that's going to, kick me in the nuts sometimes i just want to chill out 
and I just want to play like Dynasty Warriors or something, which is not super challenging. It's just, you know, I'm just going to run around and kill things for an hour. Uh, and then sometimes I will be in the mood to like jump in there and Bloodborne and get my ass handed to me. You know, it, it, it depends. You know, I, there's room for all these games. <laughs> all right. And uh, the last question by Double Dash is Final Fantasy or Tales? Ooh. This is a contentious question. I'm curious what you what you would say actually. I'm very curious. I'm going to say Tales. Okay, I, I had a feeling. I had a feeling you'd go for Tales. And, and, the, and, and the reason is because I feel like Tales is more consistently good. I feel that the Final Fantasy series is much more variable in its quality. While When it's good, they're usually really fucking good. You get great games like, you know, 7 and 9. But when it's bad, it's really, really fucking bad. Yeah, um, and that's not to say the Tales games don't don't have their stinkers, but I feel like I feel like with the Tales games, it doesn't happen as often. And when I, they and when the Tales games are great, they're also really fucking great. Yeah, I I I can get what you're saying. Final Fantasy, like especially now, like with thirteen and fifteen, it's like it's at its all time low point. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah, thirteen. <laughs> fuck thirteen. I know that game has its defenders, but fuck that game. It's a piece of shit. <laughs> I don't like the old school Final Fantasy games that much either, but I don't like the very early Tales games all that much as well. See, I think I'm more positive on the older Tales games than you are. I really like Fantasia. Uh, I liked Destiny. I'm not too fan of Eternia, it's but funny, like, I'm the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, because my problem with Eternia was like it, the battle system was a little too fast, and sometimes I would get like things would happen and, and I would get hit, and I would not really understand what happened, and I'd be dead, and I'm be like, well, what the fuck. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, while I, I understandably Destiny can feel like really slow, um, the at the spell, same time, the spells pausing it, I killed it for me. Yeah, I, that that's that's also lame. I'm, I'll grant you that, but at the very least, the game did not feel nearly as cheap as Eternia did for me. Eternia gets really rough at the final dungeon. Like that game gets really hard. Also, the the version of Fantasia I played was the PS One version. Uh, the GBA version of Fantasia, which is the only official English release, is terrible. Yeah, I, I played the Super Nintendo translated one. Uh, the Super I, Nintendo version is a decent version, but the PS1 version is a lot better. But anyways, back to the question. I'm going to go with Final Fantasy just because Final Fantasy 4 through 9 I love so much. Like, especially... Well, yeah, you're also one of those weirdos that likes 8. I love Blech. 8. I love it. Bleh. But like seven, eight, and nine in particular, and six. Six, seven, eight, and nine are like, oh, they're so good. Like nine is like I like Final Fantasy nine more than any Tales game probably. Nine is pretty great. I don't think I agree with that specifically, but I nine is pretty great. So I'm not. I won't fight you with that. Yeah, it's okay. I, yeah, I'll. It's Final Fantasy, but slightly, just slightly. Like Tales is just behind. Like like very close for me. We can both agree that they're both overall great series. Yes. Yeah, for sure. All right. So next question is uh, BB Rhino 100. In the Shin Megami Tensei series, if neutral was not an option, what alignment would you choose? Law or chaos? He goes on to say, for me, chaos would be my pick. Uh, hmm. I don't know what it says about me, but I probably would still choose Chaos. I don't know. I always like the Chaos roots in Shin Megami Tensei games. I always like to see how fucked up they can get. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. Like, I mean, on one hand, the because 
law and chaos might be misconstrued as being like, oh, law is good and chaos is evil. But in the Shin Megami Tensei games, they're not necessarily framed in that way. It Law is more so like uh, fascism. Like it's it, it is it's not as good as it sounds. No. While chaos chaos is more representative of like anarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I I'd it. say I'd say anarchy is more fun than fascism. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, next. Epic Anime Requiem. He asks three questions. Uh, the first one is, what are your thoughts on Hunter x Hunter 2011? I'm sorry, but I have not watched it, and I sincerely fucking doubt Ultimate Floyd has either. Uh, I actually saw the first episode. Uh, oh, wait, okay. Wait, wait, did you just say you haven't seen this? I have not. Oh, I have not. Okay, yeah. I, there's not much I can say, but I the, the sheer length of it puts me off. Like... Uh, I don't know, I think it's just a little too much. And then the first episode didn't really grab me. I, I know I shouldn't really be basing it on the first episode. I, I should have watched more, but yeah, I don't know, the first episode didn't do. I, I will say that, based on what I've heard of the show, that it starts off as being very typical, but that the show evolves into something more. Yeah, I've heard it gets a lot like darker. Like the first the first episode is very like uh, I don't know. It's like very like I don't know how to just describe it. Like upbeat, I guess. Like very. It didn't take itself too seriously. Mm. Yeah, I, I I I hear it gets a lot better. Um, the next question is, what are your thoughts on the first Nino Kuni? So I've only really played like I'm gonna say five hours of that game. So not e- probably not even five hours. More like I'm just gonna say a couple. I did really like what I played of it, but um, I just since I didn't play that much, I can't really give anything too detailed. The only reason I probably didn't get that far is I remember it was a gift. So I didn't even plan on getting it, and because of that, I I made no plans to to, to really get into it. So it just I just it, it just randomly fell in my lap, and I'm like, oh, I, I guess I have no Kuni now. But uh, yeah. I was in the middle of a bunch of other games, so and I just never got around to playing it again. So yeah, uh, I I'd only played it mostly to like get a feel for it um, that one time, and that's it. And I did like it though, but yeah. Yeah, I finished it uh, back when it came out. Uh, I loved it. I know a lot of people hate on this game now. I think it's generally considered to be, or at least the gameplay in it, uh, a lot of people just do not care for. Uh, I thought it was fun. The battle system is definitely the weakest part of it. It's. I think there's just uh, too much to manage, and the game can't quite handle everything going on at once. Uh, and then it's got this Pokemon collecting aspect to it that I think is really, it can be a little grindy. Uh, but like the story, I thought was pretty compelling. The it's just a beautiful game. The it brought back the f- world map uh, that I've loved about classic RPGs. So the exploration in that game was phenomenal. Uh, the music was was spectacular. It was it was a really enjoyable game. I, I liked it quite a bit. I don't I don't I didn't like think it was like a masterpiece or anything. But I'm definitely gonna play the sequel. Uh, the sequel looks looks a lot better with the battle system. It's more like action based, whereas Nino Kuni had like a semi turn based semi real time thing going on it was like almost xenoblade esque but uh yeah this one looks like more action rpg the sequel so uh it's probably going to be better yeah i'm uh, i probably won't play the sequel because i want to play through the first one but i'll at least like pick it up to show support so next question is by swordfish1390 good friend of mine he asks, what are your thoughts on the people who say Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood negates the 2003 series? So, I'm pretty sure you've never seen no, FMA. No, this is a Shintai question. <laughs> so, I'll, 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 I'll take this one. Uh, I think those people are assholes um, because I, I think mainly the, the reason why people say these things is because, well, one, they're elitists and they think that uh, because 
they prefer one show that it should automatically replace the other. Um, both of them are very different. I think both have their pros and cons and people should just enjoy what they want. And, um, I don't really see the point in like putting down other people because they preferred Brotherhood or they preferred the 2003 series. I, personally, I like them both about the same. I think they're both great. Um, they both have their issues, but yeah, fuck these people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the next question is thoughts on dubs and dub haters. Oh, this is a good, this is a good one. I like this. I have some stuff to say about this. Oh, go ahead, man. Go ahead. So a lot of people like I I can't say it uh, I can't talk about it too much in the anime from an anime standpoint because again I'm kind of mm-hmm. getting you know getting used to anime in general you know getting into it but on oh, that far, area eighty eight dub as far as uh, <laughs> Japanese like RPGs go I feel like people are way too harsh on like uh, dubs it's it's ridiculous like people there's uh-huh. so many people that just if it's if it doesn't have a uh, label just not do the english dub whatsoever and if it doesn't have uh japanese voice acting i'm not playing it you gross and it's just like honestly i think voice acting in games is honestly for the most part really good it's very rare when i play a game a japanese game and it's like oh the voice acting is pretty weak here uh it's just like for most most of every pretty much every game i play i think the voice acting just fits it's just a lot of these voice actors just do a great a great job with what they're uh with what they're given uh it's you know there are the rare times where voice acting can be bad but i like it's just i I think people just get way too hung up on it and just it just i don't know it drives me nuts when people just like will not play a game if it doesn't have a japanese dub it's just ridiculous welcome to the world of anime (laughs) <laughs> I I have seen so many motherfuckers get so pissy about dubs in anime. Like, it's the fucking worst. People are just assholes about it. It's like, hey, you like dubs? <laughs> like, fuck you. Yeah, there's this elitist attitude to a lot of like these these people that just, just drives me nuts. Like, you're really going to be a fucking snob about Chinese cartoons? Like, come on. Grow up. I mean... <laughs> I take Japanese, and this is just awful. <laughs> <laughs> What's really... This, here's the thing that I find most hilarious. These people will swear up and down that the Japanese voice actors are infinitely better than the English voice actors. Here's the thing. Unless you actually speak Japanese, who the fuck are you to make that judgment call? You don't know the language. So you don't understand the nuances of it. Therefore, you can't adequately judge whether or not the voice acting was actually any good or not. Do you want to know why there were plenty of bad dubs in early, uh, like, PlayStation 1 and even, like, TurboGrafx-16 games? It's because those were handled by Japanese people that didn't realize that the the voice acting was bad. (laughs) So just shut up. Just shut the fuck up. Ah, these people are the worst. (laughs) (laughs) Like, Resident Evil's dub. Like, for the first uh, Resident Evil on PlayStation 1, the reason it sounds as bad as as it did is because uh, it it was handled by a Japanese guy and he didn't realize it was so bad. Yep, that's the same thing with, I think, what, Symphony of the Night? Yeah, probably. Yeah, which... Yeah, hell, even a bad voice acting, I, I think a bad voice acting can, can be pretty funny, too. Like, I wouldn't change anything about Symphony of the Night. Oh, I, I, I love acting. the cheesy voice acting. It's, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. It's not by my hand. I was once again given flesh. Like, oh, it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> All right, so the next, Bufudine asks... With the Shin Megami Tensei games often tackling complex and or mature themes in each game, what themes would you like to see in a new Shin Megami Tensei games story? Mm. Um, so, 
here's the thing though Shin Megami Tensei itself mostly just tackles the law and chaos thing that we mentioned before I'm not saying they don't talk about other things but that's like the main that's like the thematic core of a lot of like the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games so um I'm not really sure what else I would like to see them tackle um but huh yeah, I don't know what do you question. think I, I'm, I actually have no idea it's always yeah I don't know that's a tough question I actually have no idea what type of themes I'd like to see if the, the series yeah, mostly I mean, tackled themes that I would have wanted to see I don't I feel like I don't know if there's really much that uh I mean, if we're counting Persona as well, like the Persona games have also delved into, uh, you know, several topics. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty content with, I'd, I'd rather them, I'd rather the writers just tackle what they want to tackle. I, I don't yeah. want to like, I, I'm not really interested in specifically seeing them like do existentialism or do determinism or do this or that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in seeing what they come up with. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, pretty much. Next is N1CK Knack. So, oh, Nick Knack. Nick Knack. Yeah, he's got a he's got a, actually a pretty a cool YouTube channel. Uh, he's been uh, he's been commenting on my videos for quite a while now. So, yeah, he's a he's a he's a great guy. All right, cool, cool. So, Nick Knack asks, are there any games people consider legendary and top tier that you guys have unfortunately not played yet? And are regretting you still haven't gotten into. Like Shintai said, he hasn't played Xenogears yet. And I, for example, still haven't played MGS1 and Chrono Trigger. Uh, shit, Chrono Trigger, shit like that. So, I mean, yeah, you already mentioned I haven't played Xenogears. So, I'm going to just I'm gonna throw in this other one. I haven't played Final Fantasy VI yet. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a that's big one. one. It's is. a big one. <laughs> What about you? You know, it's actually crazy when I think about this question. I I might have played most games now. I mean, I always because <laughs> I know there's some JRPGs that like Valkyrie Profile is probably the big one on PS One. I because there's no easy way to play that game other than I'd have to buy a PSP basically. Uh, Mario Sunshine, uh, but that's not. Uh, but he says legendary and top tier. I, I don't know, honestly. I think Valkyrie Profile might be it. It's not even like it's a still a fairly niche game. Uh, I actually might have played. I might have played pretty much everything at this point. Damn. Think about. That's yeah. Wow. Cause, uh, PS2. Because I gotta think of the systems that I missed out on, right? And it would be the the PS1 and the PS2 are the big ones I didn't grow up with. And PS2. Like what's our oh Shadow of the Colossus I get well no I play I've played it though I just haven't finished well it. I'm mean, how far did you get into it Colossus or something like the first what the first one the s- second or third I I don't remember actually but I mean I still played well it. he said well he said having gotten into not yeah I guess uh, yeah, Shadow of the Colossus so like I mean, you didn't so you technically didn't get into it yeah I mean I guess that would be. Update. There you go. There's your answer. Yeah. So next question is, and I'm not even going to attempt to say this fucking name. <laughs> I'm sorry. You'll know who you are when I when I say the question. But yeah, I'm not even going to try. Is that like um, Russian or something? I'm fairly certain, and I'm yeah. not even going to bother. Uh, he asks, generally speaking, do you prefer JRPG or Western RPG? I prefer JRPGs for sure. Um, like, no contest. I do prefer JRPGs. I do like Western RPGs, but yeah, I just generally prefer JRPGs. I feel like a lot of Western RPGs these days, it's always open world. Like, uh, I don't know. It's they tend to feel the same from one from one another, but. Uh, I, I really want to get into computer uh, Western RPGs more, CRPGs, uh, what they call them, like Pillars of Eternity, Old Baldur's Yeah, Gate. 
I, I loved Pillars of Eternity. I thought that game was fucking awesome. I really want to get into that style of game more. Uh, Divinity Original Sin 2 just came out. Apparently that game is like a masterpiece. So uh, I know I like the those games are like really have like this really in-depth storytelling like there are a lot of them have like just tons of dialogue and the way you build your character is like super in-depth with like a bunch of different mechanics going on it's very different than a lot of jrpgs but uh, i i want to get into that kind of style game more i want to get into that and you're gonna love this the reason why is because i recently picked up a book called blood sweat and pixels and it chronicles the development of 10 games. And one of the games was P Pillars of Eternity. Nice. Yeah, I've heard of that book. I've heard of the book. I definitely want to read it at some point. I, uh, if, if you don't have an aud Audible account, like the very first book that you get on Audible is free. So you can get it right now for free. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, it'll be the... Uh, you know, the audiobook version of it, which is how I listened to it. And I I was enthralled. I was it, it goes through like several different games. Uh it, it went through The Witcher Three, it did Stardew Valley, it did Destiny, it did Star Wars thirteen thirteen, where which I actually got cancelled. Yeah. So yeah, it did. So Pillars of yeah. Eternity. Interesting because yeah, the developer of that, Obsidian, I, I think they are the kings when it comes to Western RPGs and writing in games. I think their games consistently have the best uh, writing. And I went back and played Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, like I think a year ago. And that game is phenomenal. Like it's so good. It really reminded me of like, oh, Western RPGs can be like really damn good. I, I haven't played 2, but I did like the first one. Yeah, the first, it, the second one's like better than the first one. The first one was really good. The second one's like even better. I damn, I need to play it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And the PC version they did, like they did an update for it, so it has controller support, and they added like the all the mods that came out for it in there. So it fixed. It has like it's called the restored content mod. So it's like a more complete version of the game. So yeah, it's it's excellent. Oh, and that's on the Steam version. Steam version. Yep. Sweet. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get on that. So, all right. Next question is by Dreadful Boredom. He asks, if something becomes mainstream, does it lose its niche, whatever made it unique, and attracted fans to it, or does it retain it? Would like to hear your thoughts. So, I, I, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come at this question more so when a game becomes mainstream. Does it lose what made it unique? So I'm going to say it depends. I I think that by virtue of it simply becoming popular or mainstream, that doesn't automatically take away what made it special to begin with. But I do think that like if the series were to continue, right, that it could slowly whittle away what made that original good so like near automata for example already came out you know no matter how popular it becomes the game itself isn't going to change but what is going to change is the games that come after it and how much that success affects those games in the future remains to be seen so that's how i see it that's pretty much how i see it too i mean you also can look at something like uh Final Fantasy, right? Where it's like the more mainstream it got, like the turn based, like they started to get rid of turn based combat and it just got more action oriented. And uh, uh, it's just, I don't know, it got kind of worse over time. But it's, yeah, it's like, I, I think the near thing is an interesting point because it's like they said, Square said they, they want to make it a franchise now and it could very possibly lose what makes it unique especially if they like decided to make a near game without yoko taro but i don't know if they can <laughs> here's a new here's a near like phone game where you get to touch two b butt or some dumb shit yeah it's like um thing thing you could bring up i guess is the souls games because they're so popular now 
uh, the sense of discovery is lost. I with Demon Souls, right? No one really knew what it was when it came out. Uh, so people were kind of discovering things on their own and talking to people about this game. And you know, like, oh, did you find this? Did you find that? How do you do this? How do you do that? And it was like the the whole internet like discovering different things about it. But now that the series is popular, you can't really get that experience again. Uh, so you can yeah. definitely lose out on some some stuff on certain games. That's true. Uh, and the last question is by Gerson Zero. He asks, "Have you ever played Saga Frontier on the PS One? If so, what are your thoughts?" He continues on saying, "Some consider it the worst PS One SquareSoft RPG." If not, have you played any of the Saga games, including its spiritual successor, Legend of Legacy? So, me personally, I've played Saga Frontier 2, and that game had a kind of a weird structure where you could play as two characters, and at when you reached a certain point in one character's story, it would ask you if you wanted to switch to the other one. And the way that I played it was I kept continually playing as one character and I didn't want to bother playing as the other character. And when the game stopped and forced me to play as the other character, that's when I lost interest. Okay. So the saga franchise is this really weird series. It's like this very experimental rpg series every game is just like has all like these mechanics and weird like a lot of them yeah have weird structures to them and it, they're very like the storytelling is very like low-key in a lot of them as well like they're very kind of like systems driven games i haven't played saga frontier one or two uh i i have played legend of legacy uh it's it's again it's very similar to yeah those games where it's a bunch of these different mechanics that they don't really explain to you all that much and i liked it at first i thought it kind of got uh, pretty repetitive and kind of old by like the halfway point so i kind of dropped it but i think the saga games are kind of interesting i think they're fascinating games i still would really like to play saga frontier one and two uh i know there's one on the ps2 called unlimited saga which apparently was terrible because it was like this like game that like no one understood like no one could grasp it like what they had to do like it was just i i find that interesting games like that that are so complicated uh that people really struggle to get into them and where tutorials are like hours long uh fascinating games i don't know if i can really get into that that type of game but that that series the saga series has always been fascinating to me yeah i mean i'm I did like what I played of Saga Frontier 2, but I just didn't like how the one the character I was focusing on, the the game was pretty much like, okay, no, you gotta play as this other character now. So I was and that really like pissed me off. I was like, no, yeah. fuck you. I like because that character's story was actually really interesting. Um he was a character that he, he didn't he he couldn't wield magic. And because of that, the the culture that that world um, cultivated was around magic. And so there wasn't really a lot of like traditional weaponry. And he f was like one of the first people to sword like a proper sword. And, pe and it was like this amazing moment. It's like, wow, I can't believe you create a blade so big before. No one's ever done that before. And he's like, I'm going to forge even, you know, bigger, more powerful swords. Because that was the only way that he could defend himself. He didn't have magic. And, you know, people looked down on him. People didn't think that he could do anything because of the... Because he was also, like, I think he was, like, the son of, of royalty. But, you know, so it was even worse that he didn't have magic because he was he was supposed to be royalty. He was supposed to, like, secede the, the throne by this, like, ritual where he had to, like, hold a, a flame or something. And he couldn't do it because, he you know, he had no magic. And that made it that made him basically even more like an outcast. And he said, fuck that shit. And he, through sheer force of will and through his own charisma, became king. And I was like, that is bad ass. And to have that to have that story ripped away from me and be like, oh, no, you got to play this other character. I'm like, fuck you. I want to see what happens next. 
Interesting. So it does sound like it might have a bit of more of a story focus than some of the saga games. I know a lot of them, you have like 10 characters in the beginning and you choose one and they each have like their own story that you go through. Uh, the Project Oct Octopath game on Switch, it actually looks very saga inspired, actually. Uh, I, I need to try the demo of that sometime. Yeah, that looks awesome, but uh, too bad I don't have a Switch. You get one. Uh, one of these days, one of these days. All right, we're gonna we're gonna close out with uh, the our final segment, the ultimate Floyd instrumentality project. So last time we talked, uh, you saw most of Area eighty eight. Um, did you get a chance I, to finish it? I totally forgot to finish the rest of it. I don't oh. know what happened. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It's so weird. I just forgot. Okay. We'll put that on hold again, and we'll we'll bring it back up on the next episode. Hopefully, you'll fucking finish it this time. God damn it. I'll, I'll remember this time. <laughs> and then we can finally put a close to Area 88. Um, but I also asked you to watch, uh, at, at the very least, like the first few episodes of Gungrave, so... Um, how many episodes did you end up watching? So I've seen five. Oh, including the, the yeah, including the first really weird episode that we definitely got to talk about. <laughs> we definitely do. All right. So based on the first five episodes, what do you think? Okay, so this is the best thing you've shown me so far. I, yeah! I, I really like this so far. I'm I'm into it. Uh, so weird. It's like. It, it's like not the actual start of the series. I assume this is stuff that happens way later. Uh, yeah, so it's it's like an immediate res thing. So like, yeah, that first episode is actually gonna re be repeated again in like I think episode seventeen. Yeah, I was so I was watching that episode. I was so confused. I was like, what is going on? I don't know. This is I was confused. I, 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 dude, I fucking warned you that that first episode is rough. Yeah, it's, it's not a, it's, it's certainly not, if you just watched that first episode, I don't think a lot of people would be, like, super excited to watch the rest of it, but. Yeah, like, I remember when I first watched that, that episode, um, my immediate reaction was like, oh, this is going to be schlock. Like, it's, it's, it's going to just be big dumb anime action and i was kind of in the mood for that so i was more forgiving and i was just like okay yeah whatever i'll just see this dumb schlocky shit and that's not what it is no so the that's from what i've seen of the first few episodes it's this very pretty realistic realistic like uh crime drama basically mm -hmm. it reminds me of a lot of mob movies which i love like tend they tend to be some of my favorite types of movies, where you have like this uh, a gang basically, like these this gang of like childhood friends basically, uh, in this city that's like very crime ridden, uh, and they basically I, I don't know do we want to spoil I guess some of the stuff that happens. Yeah, let's go ahead and spoil it. So letting everyone know right now, if you haven't seen like the first five episodes at least of Gungrave. You're going to want to, like, skip this part, just so we can have, like, a proper discussion about it. Hey, everyone. Shintai here. Just wanted to let you know that if you skip to the 1 hour, 26 minute, and 50 second mark, you can skip the spoilers. I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. Yeah, so you, I guess you get to to meet like these characters and you get to know them, and then like most of them fucking die. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect that. No, <laughs> and it's just Harry and dude. Brandon left. <laughs> dude, dude, the ending of of episode two is like such a a fucking like eye opener, and it's like, whoa, shit is fucking real. And the guy that kills them is so like uh, I love just like how. Like, there's no bullshit with him. He's just like, he'll just kill people. It's you know, no problem. It's no problem. Yeah, because his, like, I think it's like his little brother or something. He's just like this piece of shit. He's just uh, pretending to be a gang lord or whatever. And he's his 
he comes in, he's like, I'll show you how it's done. And he just like fucking <laughs> cleans house. Yeah. So like, so it's got like this really kind of like pretty depressing beginning to the show. And then basically like uh, they want to try to like, uh, get escape the city but brandon like which is the main character who's the main character he's got i guess i guess it's his girlfriend uh maria oh uh, maria yeah basically yeah. Uh, i'd say though like for most of the second episode it's it's not really that depressing like it's pretty gritty but like you get to see them like as a gang together and they're getting into like hijinks and whatnot. And yeah. It's really the ending. And it's yeah. really like the ending of that second episode where one of them dies, where it's like stark reality hits them and it's no longer fun and games. Yeah. But I, I basically eventually it becomes like this cool thing where it's like, they're trying to basically infiltrate the organization. Uh, and then Brandon's kind of in there to, you know, eventually meet Maria again because the the head guy of this organization has taken her in after her uncle dies. Big Daddy. Uh, big Daddy, yeah. So Brandon's in there to try to yeah get to see her again, and then his friend Harry, he's more into it because he wants to. Like Harry is an interesting character. I really like this uh, this character. It's I can't get like a full read on him yet. But I guess he just, he wants to be, like, just probably the head of the organization. Like, he's so into this, like, uh, this this way of life. Uh, he's, like, very, yeah, very talkative. Very talkative. Like, he's almost, he's very different from Brandon. And I can think the relationship between the two of them is actually probably one of the more interesting things about the show. Yeah, I agree. Because Brandon is very stoic and quiet. A little too quiet sometimes, uh, but, yeah, you know, especially in, like, the the second episode uh, he it's 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 a little weird but he does like talk more as the show goes on he opens up more and they do poke fun at how like awkward and quiet he is so it's at least like lampshade yeah. and made fun of a yeah, little bit I, I did yeah I, I like that yeah too and just like all the mob stuff too is i just like i love that kind of shit like showing like how the organization works stuff like that i just i always dig that kind of thing uh yeah so i guess really enjoying it i'm definitely interested to see where it goes from here i the first episode makes it seem like it's like the realistic mob tone of it is not gonna stick forever <laughs> um yeah so at some point the show is going to reintegrate the sci-fi element and i'm not gonna lie um the sh i do feel like when the show does that um the show i'm not gonna say like totally dips in quality but it's it's not quite as good anymore but then i think it makes up for it by the the just amazing ending like that final episode is like as close to perfect as you're gonna get okay yeah i, I i'm very curious to see what i think of like the, the added sci-fi supernatural type elements so i'm usually I, uh, not a fan yeah. of that kind of stuff I will say, like, at least in their de in in the show's defense, like, well, first of all, this is based on a video game. Wait, what? I thought the the video game was yeah. based on the anime. No, the what? game came first. It that's interesting. So, because of that, I think that this is the best video game adaptation ever made. Yeah! Wow, I would have not expected that doesn't feel uh -huh. like that at all. There's no but, way the video game is as is, is, is strong. But the thing is, I think it's also kind of held back by the fact that it's an adaptation of a game. Because, like, if it was its own thing, it probably wouldn't have had this weird sci-fi shit in it. Yeah. It probably would have made for a better show. Yeah, that's true. That's true, now that you mention it. So, it, it is kind of a shame. But at the same time, I still feel like the show is just so fucking good that, like, the sci-fi bullshit, like, I can ignore it because, like, everything else is just so fucking strong. Like, the characters are so well written. The story is so engaging. Uh, the relationships between, between the characters, there's chemistry there. Like, it's so good. So, and I will at least, like, say, like, I will at least say, like, they do make an attempt to to try and integrate the sci-fi stuff 
into the story in a way that made sense. So yeah. I'll, I'll at least give them that. Yeah, the the music uh, is really good too. I I like like a lot of like yeah. violin music in a lot of areas. Yeah, yeah, I love the soundtrack. It's it so reminded good. me of Rule of Rose a little bit actually. Some of the music. Oh yeah, huh? Interesting. Yeah, it doesn't have the horror aspect no, to it. Yeah, it's but... not as like uh, abrasive or or anything, but yeah, the soundtrack is phenomenal. Like. Um, like every time I, I, I watch the show, uh, that, that ending theme, that ending sequence, like I always have to sit through it because yeah. the song is so good. Yeah. Like even though the, the singer has like a weird voice, like it's still like, oh, it's such a good song. The, I'm watching the English dub of this and you said it was like, I, I think it's pretty good. It's not like amazing. I don't think, but it's, it's good. Yeah. I think it's a good dub. I think it gets better as the show goes on though. Yeah, I the female characters can be a little I don't know. They're... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's, some of the dialogue's a little cheesy too. Like some of the dialogue, I was like, Egh. but most of it's well, most of it's quite good. I I would also blame that probably on the dub. I remember it because I just saw it recently subtitled, and the 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 dialogue is different. Okay, because when you're, um, because when when the voice actor is saying the lines, they have to match the lip flaps, so they'll sometimes have to alter the dialogue in order to to fit it better. Right. And as as a result, the dialogue that you hear in the dub is won't be the same as the subtitles. But so yeah, I, I, yeah. But yeah, fuck yeah, I'm glad you're liking it. Yeah, it's 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 quite good. Sweet. So, um, next time, hopefully, you can finish Area Eighty Eight, and we can (laughs) so (laughs) we could talk more about that. And I I guess that's I I I I sincerely doubt you'll finish all of Gungrave. You know, by the time the next episode rolls around, is it like twenty six or something? Yeah, twenty six. Six. Wow, that is still up. So yeah, I'm pretty sure you won't finish the show by then. So I think next time we'll just talk about Area 88 and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that makes sense. Cool beans. Well, I'm I'm super glad that you like Gungrave because it's like it's such an underrated show. It's so good, but like a lot of a lot of people get turned off by that first episode. Understandably, yeah. <laughs> definitely see that. So. I've you know I've seen a lot of people get turned off by that first episode and it's like no you gotta keep watching, so I'm glad that you you were able to power through it and then be pleasantly surprised by what is like actually like a fucking great show. Yeah, I feel like I, I don't know as far as like uh, anime goes. Yeah, I feel like I feel like like Gungrave like I don't hear it like mentioned in like the like when a lot of people talk about like the best anime out there. Like I don't know I don't hear Gungrave talked about a whole lot. Yeah, it's not really all that well known, unfortunately, which is a shame because I think it's really fucking good. I think an- probably another reason why it's not super popular is the like it's not an ugly looking show, but like even for its time, it wasn't especially good looking. Ah. So, so it was. It's kind of a low budget show. Really? Yeah, I don't think it looks like terrible or anything. No, it doesn't look awful, but like when you compare it to like some other stuff that came out around the same t- around the same time, like it's a lot more eye catching, right? But it more than makes up with that with the great characters and the compelling story, for sure. All right, that's an episode. Uh, I want to thank everyone for watching. You know, we are the final bosses. And we'll see you next time. 